we are starting now, good evening. What you have just seen, it has been a scene design in action. So welcome to uh, the first in a series of uh, lectures dedicated to the scene design. Uh, I'm really happy because we have so many people here tonight and because some people are not from scene design course, I'm going to use myself first. My name is Tatiana Dalic Dinolovic and I'm a teacher of scene design at this um, faculty. I'm also head of a uh, doctorate uh, in arts program of scene design. And for us, it's a very special occasion because this is the public opening of our course. We actually had a workshop with uh, our guest yesterday, and that, that was our formal working beginning of the course. But today, we are very, very lucky to have Professor Dorita Hanna, who is going to talk about uh, Procadrenial and her personal uh, experience. Uh, we have asked her to be uh, here with us because what she actually does is something that the scene design is uh, in its core. She works um, in between space, performing arts and visual arts and that's what we are actually uh, talking about when we talk about the scene design. Professor Hanna teaches at the University of Helsinki and also Tasmania, but also we are really proud because she is our guest professor. And uh, please uh, join me in uh, welcoming Professor Hanna for actually the first time here. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Tatiana. And, and I just want to thank Raja as well. We've, we realized we've been talking about this for 18 years. Um, it, when, when he was thinking of scene design and, and I followed the, the establishment of the course and it's so great to be here because I feel that in relation to the thinking that I've been creating around performance design, it's most coheres with scene design here in Novi Sad. So it's fantastic to, to be here and feel like I'm, we're kind of speaking the same language rather than having to start at, at, from the beginning in terms of how you might construct your own theories around um, this notion of performance design or design for performance in, in a kind of expanded field. Uh, working between architecture and performance, between space and scenography. So I'm very happy to be here and I've been asked to talk about the, uh, my work in relation to the Prague Quadrennial. And next year, 2015, I, is, is uh, the Prague Quadrennial and it's been going since 1969, every four years. So it's always been the, um, a, a wonderful four yearly gathering of architects and designers interested in, and artists interested in design. And it used to be the Prague Quadrennial of scenography and theatre architecture and it's now the Prague Quadrennial of performance design and space which I think is fantastic because what it's done is it has expanded the idea of performance in relation to the performing arts to really think about how we perform in our daily lives and also how performance itself is a political act and has political dimensions. So um, what I'm going to do is talk to you about the work that I've done with the Prague Quadrennial, both the work that I've exhibited in it since 1995 20 years next year makes me feel very, very old. Um, and um, and uh, both as an exhibitor, exhibiting in the New Zealand National Exhibit, uh, but also as a designer and a curator for PQ. So I feel very lucky to have um, had this opportunity to have an ongoing relationship with PQ. And um, last, uh, <laughs> you're on camera. <laughs> all right. And um, last week I was in PQ and I was meeting uh, the, the people who are involved in, in uh, working out different, different uh, aspects of the schedule and the performance schedule and the program. And it was so wonderful to see all these great new faces and young people. And um, so it's this wonderful sort of regenerating four yearly event. And I hope through showing uh, both my work uh, how I operate as a performance designer and as a performance architect and as a theorist uh, 
as well as the, as well as the Prague Quadrennial itself, you might get a kind of a sense of, um, of uh, both my relationship with it and, and the event itself. So I'm, I'm particularly interested in this idea of um, acting out. It, yeah, acting out. So the idea of the force of performance design is, is, is acting out and acting up and, and being an activist as well. So it's thinking about um, moving outside of the traditional confines of theatre, both as a building but also as an art form. Um, and so I'm really interested in it on a kind of political activist level, but also on a very theatrical level. So the exciting thing about this year's, next year's Prague Quadrennial is that it's going to be in the city, in multiple sites. In the past, it's always been in one site where it gathers everybody. Um, and this year, it's in different palaces in Prague, which is really exciting. And it's akin to the Venice Biennale, where you... It's what I love about the Venice Biennale. You, you wander around Venice and you go into the different palazzi and you see different exhibits from, from different um, places. So, um, but I'll just introduce myself uh, because I'm interested in space and performance. I'm sorry that the, there's a bit of reflection on the... Uh, uh, on the screen. <laughs> it would be good to have the lights out, but then you can't see me. And, um, and I think this is very interesting because we were negotiating how to work between the live event of presenting and the recorded event uh, that's going to be online. And it's that kind of thing that I'm going to talk about at the end too. So I guess that's interesting, but in a way I'm a bit disappointed about the quality of the images. But anyway, space and performance uh, are really important to me as a theatre architect and a scenographer. And uh, I work uh, with performative spaces, so that is thinking of sites as public events. So as an architect, I'm really interested in how space performs in our daily lives the kind of active forces that exist within space and how we then come into it and we activate space. So spatial performativity and then um, performance space. So as a theatre architect, I specialise in performing arts venues um, designed to house the event. Uh, but uh, it, the more I've been um, uh, focusing on this, the less interested I am in the conventional sites. And that's another thing that Rajan and I have shared over the years, is this idea of um, theatre leaving, leaving the building and then leaving theatre as an art form to kind of go into a, a more expanded idea. And the other uh, a aspect is performing spaces in relation to the aesthetic event, uh, integrating art, architecture and design. So. Uh, uh, traditionally called sonography, but now thinking about that in an expanded idea. And then also thinking about that in relation to design-led research. So using my design work as a way of, and my collaborative work as a performance maker, as a way of exploring and experimenting with space. And particularly architecture, because architecture and public space once it's built, it's there forever. Whereas the great thing about uh, doing these temporary events is you can explore, you can be experimental, and maybe you come upon something that might shift things or that you might be able then to, to build in more enduring architectures. So that's, that for me, uh, uh, fleeting events become a mode of embodied research through practice. And so for me, the performance designer is not designing some elements for performance, but collaboratively orchestrating all elements as performance. Um, and so I'm very interested in this idea of designing performance, but also performing design. So performing design being something that you are exploring, that you are in an embodied way going out and exploring rather than representing it in models and drawings and then handing it over to someone to build and actually going out and testing it in space and time with performers and with audiences. I think that's a very exciting way to operate. Uh, so the Prague Quadrennial uh, 
this is the, the title, uh, it's the Prague Quadrennial and the Expanded Global Stage. Um, and of course, you know, the whole notion of a global stage is both interesting because how fantastic we can all gather together and meet or have these online uh, documents. But also, as we know, globalization is also complex and complicated. For example, I'm speaking to you in English. I am so happy that you all can understand English or that I've been invited to speak. And uh, I know that it's not, I really admire the fact that you're all taking this in in a language that isn't your first language. But it's interesting how the English language dominates, it becomes the common language. And in a way, it kind of colonizes the, uh, it, it colonizes the discourse just by pure virtue of the fact that we're speaking, that PQ is run in English, that so many of these events are run in English. Um, and also this idea, this year, for next year's PQ, I keep saying this year because it feels so close, um, is, is looking at shared space, which I think is a really lovely theme. The idea of sharing space and what that means. And so fantastic that it's in the city, so that they're really encouraging performance to be played out in the city, in which case we're sharing space with the public, with tourists. It's a really dynamic way of engaging. Although I have to say, as someone who's also going to make a performance in the city, I feel it's going to be very carnivalesque. And so uh, we are challenged as, as people making a performance in the city with this idea that there's going to be lots of people performing and there's this idea of tribes, so there'll be lots of costumes around, etc. So it's, it's going to be a real challenge, but it's so fantastic that it's in the city. And so for the, ne for the next PQ, I am the theory curator, so I've been asked to curate the theory talks. Uh, and I'm also, uh, as I said, I'm a performance maker. So I have to, uh, at the moment, try and find sites in the city of Prague, uh, which I was doing last week, that where you can make a performance that's in keeping with the, with the practice, but also maybe something that doesn't intersect too much with the theatricality of Prague, which itself is an incredibly theatrical city. There's so many people dressed in Baroque outfits trying to sell you concerts, you know, and, and to Mozart or whatever, and churches, etc. So it's inherently theatrical. And then along comes the layer of the PQ with all the students and the performers performing. And then you're trying to make an, a, a performance within that, I think is a challenge. So I've, I spent the last few days walking through the streets trying to think about ways where also the tourists, the, the density, the pure density of tourists in Prague in the summer is extraordinary. So it's going to be very interesting to see how performance can negotiate these. Uh, they're like, it's like swimming in a sea full of shoals of fish, you know, and the locals are always trying to work out ways of, of missing all the tourists because they're so dense in the city. So it's going to be interesting. But the theory talks will take place in this wonderful uh, ballroom in a palace in one of the old palaces. So the, the different sites for all the exhibits will be in these old palaces. And they're wonderful. They're sort of slightly shabby and you know falling apart. Uh, they haven't yet been renovated. And, and they've got a, or they've been renovated in the 70s and 80s. So they've got a certain sort of charm. Uh, and this is the space where the theory talks will take place. And I'll, I'll talk about that later because I think that what's interesting about this is that, that the curators who were looking at how the space is organised are also thinking about radical ways of pulling people together in space. So, I, I, I kind of, uh, one of the ideas I've got uh, for the uh, theory talks next year, but also as a kind of a theme in my own work running, running over the years, is this idea of inscriptions of crime and pardon, thinking of shared performative space and the scenographic exhibit. And this idea of bearing witness, you know, that we gather together in performance to bear witness. And I think it's a very important uh, notion in our time, particularly of a sort of a global satura saturation of media and social media, this idea of gathering in a kind of live event to bear witness, which is a kind of funny old-fashioned thing about theatre, but still a wonderful thing. 
So thinking about scenography then in the classic sense as a kind of scenography, as a, as a, as a scenic writing, uh, but also as a sort of spatial scripting, and then thinking of inscriptions in social space, and therefore a spatial and social dramaturgy. So I think that's a, a very interesting thing that this idea of shared space is about, a spatial and social dramaturgy. And I've always been interested in a wonderful essay that Helene Sixou wrote called The Place of Crime, The Place of Pardon, way back in 1987, where she writes, we live outside ourselves in a world whose walls have been replaced by television screens a world that has lost its thickness, its depths, its treasures, and we mistake newspaper columns for our thoughts. We are imprinted daily. We even lack the wall, the real wall on which divine messages are written. We're lacking earth and flesh. And she was writing about this in 1987, before the internet. Um, so, and, and at that time she was talking about newspapers and television screens. Now, of course, we know that, that the screen has proliferated. Newspapers and television is almost redundant, but there is this new rise of the screen that, that's very interesting. So therefore, thinking about this place to be a witness. And also, those who come to bear witness is really important. And it relates to this idea of theory or theoria, which is a looking at, a viewing, and a beholding that was also related to the theatron as a place for beholding and for viewing. But the theorists were the people that came to bear witness. And then thinking of this idea of this gathering ground for re-bearing witness to disappeared acts. So often what happens in the Prague Quadrennial is we want to uh, present things that have been and gone. And that's, it's so different to presenting art, because art is a thing in itself, or performance art or whatever. But the past operas and the past theatres and the past dances, etc., they're all, they've disappeared. And so we have to somehow gather the traces and, and then represent them at PQ. And that's been the biggest challenge of the Prague Quadrennial, which I think is why it's becoming more and more about a live event rather than uh, representing old events. So therefore, thinking about the scenographic exhibit that rises to the challenge of how to represent disappeared acts. And there's a wonderful quote that's a very important quote by performance theorist Peggy Phelan, which is that performance's only life is in the present. Performance cannot be saved, recorded, documented, or otherwise participate in the circulation of representations of representations. Once it does so, it becomes something other than performance. Well, in relation to what we're thinking about, where we inherently have to represent in some way, I'm really interested in this idea of other performance and other performance rather than so we're not representing a performance but in its representation it becomes another performance and I think that's really important. So therefore we think of performance as being presentational. Right now I am presenting to you. It's it's live, it's presentational. The presentation is full of representations. So I'm trying to present to you ideas through these representations of <coughs> words and images. But in Prague, I think we're trying to do kind of what maybe the internet documentation is trying to do, which is represent, is to think of the representation as a representation and therefore an other performance. So that, that is the th one of the key things that I have been looking at in my own work as an exhibitor in Prague, the way that it becomes a new performance, the exhibit itself becomes a kind of performative statement rather than a gallery for old images and photographs and dead models and dead costumes. And they are dead, I think, unless we make them performative. So I'm going to start off with um, my very first presentation at Prague, which was back in 1995, where I was very excited to have a work selected um, uh, to represent New Zealand. Uh, and I call this a singular object that bears witness to remains. 
So the show was called Na Tangata Toa. It's not a very good, unfortunately you can't really see, but it was, a, it was a reworking of the Vikings of Helgoland, but set in New Zealand in a remote Maori community after World War I. And so it was a new work, uh, which is called Bicultural in New Zealand. You have Maori theatre, you have New Zealand uh, Pakiha theatre, uh, non-Maori theatre, and you pull them together and you have bicultural theatre. So I was very lucky to be in a moment when uh, this bicultural theatre company formed, because after a few performances and, and seasons, they decided, rightly so, the Māori community, that they don't really know about Māori theatre and that they want to go away and do that, and then they'll come back later and, t and, and attempt bicultural theatre, the moment it was kind of very weighted towards Pākehā theatre, um, which means non-Māori. So it was set in this remote community where, back in New Zealand, um, actually probably before the internet, um, uh, we were so remote that we were always behind. So things in the Edwardian time were still in the Victorian time, etc. And people used to laugh when I was a kid at the photographs, the postcards of New Zealand, because they looked so old because they had such old cars. So, you know, now with the internet, we, we're kind of caught up with communication and travel, etc. But we've always been a little behind the times. So that became an interesting way of dealing with the performance. So I made this very environmental performance with a wooden floor, a big uh, uh, a pool of black, a big black pool of water, and mirrors at the end that reflected the structure of the, of the space. And what I did as well is, as an architect, because it was a black box, I wasn't interested in black boxes, so I lifted the lights above the trusses that were already there. So the grid was under the truss and we lifted it up over the truss. And then I built posts up to the truss. So I basically tried to integrate the existing architecture with the, uh, with the architecture of, the, of the, the scenography. And then I filled the theater with black iron sand. And I actually, it's very heavy iron sand. So I had to do careful calculations that we didn't collapse the theater with all the sand. So um, anyway, this was, uh, and then uh, the, the costume designs kind of worked, as I said, between the Victorian and the Edwardian with this wonderful um, warrior woman, um, Rongomai, who comes back to this village to exact revenge for the death of her father. And so when we came in, it was like you come onto a marae, a meeting house, where they're there, the, the, the performers are there singing to you, and then you gather around, and then afterwards there's korero, people talk, there's a, a, a discussion afterwards, so it doesn't begin and end with the performance. Um, and then, of course, this was the beginning of thinking about the idea of a universal landscape, often because there was no money. Uh, there's very little money, and it's very hard for people to be professional sonographers in New Zealand. So um, the idea of, a, of a, a universal landscape that shifts and change, that's a kind of rich environment that can shift and change in the imagination, in the end becomes the kind of, uh, uh, it seems like the logical way of doing things. Plus technology, for me, if it has to drop or change or shift, it'll break down. So I quite like the static. And that things shift with light and movement. So it became this universal landscape that was indoors, outdoors. And then in the end, the, the marae is burnt down and Rongomai kills her lover and walks across the pool uh, between the mirrors into a slice of light. So uh, to present that, came up with the idea of a travelling box uh, that it's a very simple idea that, that, that everything packs up in this travelling box and, it, and is then unpacked um, as an artefact at PQ. And so the box then becomes the design and inside the design it has a, a, a photo album on one side and on the other side it has a writing describing the performance and a model on top. But inside is a wakahuya. A wakahuya is a box for treasures. Um, and inside that wakahuya, which is this beautifully crafted box, I worked with one of my students, who's since become a, a great designer in New Zealand, um, and we had the sound operator create 
a soundscape that emanated from this box in this flax-lined um, case. So then, through that, I decided that it was important that we had a more unified, rather than people just coming separately and designing their own exhibit, that New Zealand was much more unified conceptually with their exhibit. So I created a landing, seven stages Aotearoa New Zealand, Aotearoa being uh, the um, Māori word for New Zealand that a lot of New Zealanders now use, and the national exhibit, which was a table. So the idea was that we called it landing, and, and a landing is like a jetty where you land, but it's also like a vessel that you can then sail to other places, and it's also like a table. So we're really interested in this kind of making this landscape. Uh, and this is a painting by uh, Colin, McCall, uh, Colin McCann called um, Light Falling Through a Dark Landscape. So this idea of making this table as a landscape through which a shaft of light emanated. And then upon that uh, were all the exhibits and each one was individually lit. So we asked people, what would you bring to the table? And a national jury selected people to exhibit at the table. And then only when people sat down and engaged with the exhibits, um, physically, did they come to really understand the work and the different layers in the work. And you could open drawers and feel uh, the surface changing, etc. And this is the work that my work was selected, my costumes, for uh, a Catherine Mansfield a play based on Catherine Mansfield's stories, a kind of an opera, a, a neo-opera, um, that, that was about Catherine Mansfield's illness uh, being like, uh, she was tubercular, so the idea was uh, uh, reflecting her illness in, this, in the costumes, where she's sick and then, and then there's a kind of exhaustion in the second act, in the first act she's kind of in a hospital, and then in the second act the costumes are all sort of drained out um, on the seashore. So I basically collected all the remains of bits of samples and swatches from the, from the costume floor and I was interested in how you, you present work through the remains that are washed up on the shores of the studio. Um, having a scrapbook out of the catalogue and then also these jars that re presented the costumes that are set in oil, these kind of strange um, uh, abstract uh, 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 assemblages. So th through that e exhibition, which won a UNESCO prize, PQ asked me to design the central exhibit or work with them on the central exhibit for uh, 2003. And we called it the heart of PQ because it was in the central hall at the very heart where people had to pass through. And we called it a performance landscape for the senses. So it was in this uh, huge building, um, giant building of Vista Vista, one of the exhibition halls, quite overwhelming to look at, and then thinking about it as a landscape that bears witness, so a landscape within the space. And so looking at this idea of how do you kind of create a landscape within the space, and we did it by thinking about um, creating an abstract landscape with five towers and each one representing one of the senses, the five classic senses, which of course are constructed senses, but uh, they're, they're things that we're familiar with. So we created this undulating landscape above, around, through which different performances and installations could occur with these towers set into this landscape that therefore created a kind of a labyrinth for the senses where people discovered things, they moved up through and around. Um, and we workshopped this in Germany um, where we actually workshopped it in the landscape with the, with the different people who were collaborating with us. And then we created these towers and set them within the space and it became this kind of landscape that had a kind of chaotic series of performances over 10 days um, happening that began with a 15 metre long landscape of food and then had multiple performances happening during the day and at night more curated performances by the curators of the senses. And then of course there were multiple stages on, upon which 
the audience could be, or the performance could be, or they could um, end up being together. So this is the Tower of Light, uh, of Sight, the Tower of uh, Taste, uh, where they made this chaotic, crazy dinner. RK, they're a visual arts group, and then they dressed the, the, the tower with the remains of the feast, and it got smellier and smellier over 10 days. And then this is the Tower of Touch, and we wanted to look at touch not being necessarily just physical, but technological, that we live in a time of technological touch. And so I worked with Carol Brown, who's a fantastic uh, a, a curator who was based in London at the time. And uh, we made this anatomical tower of touch. And then you would look down at Carol performing through a slot in a table down below, moving in and out of view. And then you could go and lie underneath the projection silo and look up at the performer being projected um, and through this projection silo. So there was this different ways of seeing the performance. And then at night, she presented the performance on the landscape as a kind of a site-specific performance, promenade performance. And then ended up, she utilised the undulating landscape. So the idea was to refute the idea of a, a flat stage. And of course, the most important thing were the people who were gathered around and the participants, the people who became part of the performance, part of a community. And at the end of Carol's piece, unfortunately, you can't see it, everybody did a tango together. So in the end, despite thinking about technological touch, people ended up touching. It was very lovely. So we then took that back to New Zealand uh, and, and presented that exhibition in an exhibit in an art gallery where we called it Display, Remembering a Performance Landscape. And so we put it into a white gallery and within that white gallery was a black box diorama that had the model in it and little models embedded within the space. And then when you looked in through the, uh, the hole at the, at, the big, at the black box that had the model, you would see the model with projections of the performance on it. So again, what we were trying to do was create a landscape within which people passing this long, thin gallery, you would then become a performer on this abstracted landscape. The next project that Carol, well, Carol and I then, from working together on the Tower of Touch, um, started to collaborate together. Uh, and we uh, created a project, a lo an ongoing project called Tongues of Stone, or Making Space Speak, based on Antonin Artaud's um, statement that the problem is to make space speak, to feed and furnish it like mines laid in a wall of rock, which all of a sudden turns into geysers and bouquets of stone. So this idea of how do you make, it's something I'm really interested in in, rela in relation to architecture, because architecture is considered this inanimate form, but how can it speak? How is it actually performative? How does it have mobility in it? And of course a rock is the most slow performer probably around. Um, so we're interested in, in working between moving bodies and stones. And we called our, uh, we've called ourselves MAP, Movement Architecture Performance, and we work with entangled thresholds of encounter to co-create site responsive works that fold audiences into live performance whilst attending to the fractured narratives of place, memory, and mythology. Since 2003, we've produced a body of work uh, that's profoundly informed by catastrophic events on the world stage, linking the lived present to long buried traumatic pasts through a deterritorialization of the performance frame. And the first one that we did was in uh, Athens in the uh, Isadora Duncan Centre in Athens, which Isadora's brother, Raymond, actually started to build as a temple to her art. I don't know if you know Isadora. Isadora Duncan was kind of the, the godmother or the, 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 one of the inventors of um, modern dance, where she took the ballet slippers off and the corsets and everything and danced in kind of Greek togas. And I don't think she's been as seriously, taken as seriously as, as she really should be now. I think she's been dismissed. And I think a lot of the, the avant-garde men from that time uh, ha have persisted. And uh, so for me, it was a wonderful opportunity to, to work in this building that was designed for Isadora and is probably one of the few avant-garde uh, uh, buildings that got built 
but it's a very curious building. And so uh, we had 14 dancers and I took a model of the place with me from New Zealand, but we actually worked on the site to create the performance. So basically it was a performance that started outside that then moved in simultaneously into three spaces and then the audience went outside onto the, um, onto the courtyard uh, and then the thing finished with the dancers dancing on the rooftops that opened the performance out. So it, we were looking at the sites like this outside space which was a reservoir um, and then here you can see the rooftop dancers um, and, and finishing it by kind of opening it up into the city. So then we did Arero Stone, a solo in a performance landscape. And in Māori, Arero means tongue. So we were thinking, how do you talk the hard talk? How do you talk about things that are difficult to speak about? <laughs> and also, we were interested in uh, women who had been turned to stone as a form of punishment. And that was, uh, I, that was provoked by the Moscow theatre siege with the, the female suicide bombers, where we saw these women, these strange, spectral, um, veiled figures that, where the, the body had become the kind of ultimate weapon of a bomb. And, um, but also trying to deal with these media images in a way that, that, that acknowledge the kind of mythological dimension, but also the historical dimension and how these things are played out in the media. So I created a site that again melded the existing stage. I got rid of all the curtains and everything and exposed the gray stage and, and the lighting technology and then uh, placed this uh, installation within it that had a pool of water, a black mirror floating overhead and some um, a black, shiny black vessels. So giving the dancer uh, forms of resistance, rather than the dancer dancing in a big open space, uh, uh, it, it, having the dancer actually deal with a kind of an architecture uh, of the stage and also the architecture of the scenography. And it finished with Carol lying in the pool with her, her um, image doubled up overhead, reflected overhead. And we were also dealing with this kind of shape-shifting costume that looked at these kind of different media and mythological issues and, and images. So for us, dance architecture uh, posits spaces of encounter which aim to shift an understanding of our disciplinary fields from being object-centered, i.e. the making of a dance or the making of a building, to being subject-centered about relationships and interconnectedness between people and spaces. Um, so uh, we explore what happens when the slow time of the built environment intersections with the varying temporalities of historical, aesthetic, and embodied daily events. And in producing dynamic exchanges between bodies and places, we endeavor to make space speak and therefore <laughs> shift the spectators' expectations about where they might come to experience a dance or a built environment. And so the next project that we did was called Tongues of Stone in Perth, Perth Dancing City, part of the International Dancing City Project, where in Australia we worked in the city of Perth, which is a mining city, to create a performance through two um, research and development projects. So our dancers were working in the city with us, with buckets, with sand, with, with um, flour, with uh, water, um, and uh, exploring how the city operates, how we can choreograph not just the dancers, but choreograph a public as well, and looking at the, the city, the ma old maps of Perth, to create a walk through Perth, through the, all the little back alleys and buildings, uh, so that the Perth people experienced a part of Perth that they didn't know about, threading this way like threading a river. And so the idea was that there once was a river, in, uh, in Perth. There were many waterways, but they were drained when the um, Europeans came, and that meant that the Nyunga people, the Aboriginal people, had to, you know, they were deprived of their wetlands and of their hunting grounds. So we became really interested, too, in the, in the, in the speaking in the city, the signs that were made about 
one way, no, no smoking, no parking, um, no stopping, etc. this kind of visual babble. And um, we placed these figures in, and we were also interested in wind, the air, leaving what we called leaving the dead air of the theatre, for, the, you know, for the gusts of wind that happened, for the changes in light when, when the clouds went over the sun, for the, for the different densities of crowds moving in the city. It was fantastic. After you work like that, you don't want to work on the stage anymore. It's so dead. You know, it was just really living. Every performance was different because every, we did it three times a day. And it was different densities of crowds, different forms of light. It was, it was really beautiful. And um, we, it, the audience had a soundscape. So for an hour they walked through the city listening to the soundscape and following the performance, being led by the performance as well as coming upon the performance. So the audience was both planned were those with the headphones, but it was also accidental. And so it started off in the, the railway station, which was where the lake once was that was drained, and through the back alleys where you came upon these mythological creatures who were furies. We were basing it on an Ovid myth about Philomela and Procne, as well as Aboriginal myth of the Woggle, which is the serpent that formed the rivers of Prague, of Perth. And then, um, so you'd go to back, back, alleys and uh, fire escapes and, and this woman with the long red training dress would become this kind of serpent type uh, seam running through the city in and out of buildings. And then it ended up with the dancers stripping off their costumes and hanging them from the uh, ghost gum trees and, and shedding the serpent's um, tail uh, skin and then carrying it off into the distance. So the, these, these three were selected for uh, exhibition in PQ in 2011, and we thought, how do we exhibit this? It's another challenge. How do we exhibit our work, you know? Um, how, how do we uh, present something uh, that was living, uh, that's now all we've got left are some props and some costumes that are kind of like empty skins, empty insect carapaces. So we, um, it was in the, the Veltrigini Palace, which is the contemporary art gallery, and uh, the designers of the New Zealand section came up with an idea of a tower, make a fly tower. So because we had a limited square footage, they decided we would have everything stored up, and it would be lowered, and there'd be different performances throughout the day. So you could hoist people's work away and then lower it down for performance. So we decided we would lower down these empty costumes that would just, and, and scatter the stage with the, with the props. And so they would be like these things waiting to be inhabited and to perform. And um, so Carol would then don these costumes and perform excerpts from the performances, but specific to the site of the Veltrigini Palace and the audience that was gathered around. And then in the end, we hoisted the big, it was a giant dress that was in, in Athens, hoisted it out of a hole in the, in the stage, and then she invited someone to come up and stitch, because the red stitch, the red seam was a common theme in all three performances. And so the, the very final image um, was of, and then she'd leave the stage, and the final image would be of, of somebody just lost in the work of, of stitching and she would have long disappeared. So it was, it was again trying to look at live, how you would inhabit with a live performance. And of course those of us who were there um, would have gone to the intersection which was, design, which was uh, curated by Sodja uh, Zupanch Lotka, who's the um, curate, she's the director for PQ, where she worked with uh, Oren Sajiv, who's a, uh, an Israeli architect, to create um, I like another heart of PQ, but this time in the heart of the city, these white boxes that the audience again would create a labyrinth that the audience could move through. And in each box she had invited artists, performance artists, performing artists, theatre artists, uh, visual artists to create work. And this was one of my favourites, it was uh, Monica Pormale's hug. So people would come in and they would hug each other and turn into a kind of a sculpture. But it was very beautiful, but people who knew each other, people who didn't know each other, would become this kind of exhibit. And then this one I also loved too, which was the sonographer um, working in his, 
in a model box, framed uh, with this frame, uh, doing a beautiful, um, you know, uh, classic scale model uh, with his pipe, smoking his pipe. Um, so it was a really beautiful sort of performance. And then people, there was another one where people um, learnt to tango, and then one that had a, a Europoly, which was a kind of political game about Europe. And then, of course, there was extreme costume. Um, and extreme costume was the costume exhibit that uh, invited uh, countries from around the world to uh, propose who would, uh, who could exhibit. And then, and then an international jury selected the work, and it was quite beautifully exhibited in Prague. So here it was a highly curated show. And um, the student who worked with me on, um, she was a master's student who worked with me on Tongues of Stone in Perth, had actually created this red dress for her work, um, which of course drew on the giant dress that, that I had also established for um, the Athens project. And she moved around the city with this giant dress and found that it, you know, it would whip up in the wind and it would, it, she, she hurt her back and it became this huge thing that she called the monstrous feminine in the city. So she was looking at the rhythms of the city through this dress uh, and how it can kind of engage with architecture. And then she made a performance uh, where she um, had uh, plumbers dye uh, which is a non-toxic dye embedded in the folds of her skirt and, and it leaked out into the harbour. And, and in working, because she worked with us on this uh, professional uh, project where her skirt became, uh, uh, where I adapted her skirt for the performance, she could put in her work for the professional uh, extreme costume and um, and it was selected. There were two works selected from New Zealand and both of them were students of mine. And this is um, the work of, uh, this is the work that won the Costume Design Award uh, by Emma Ransley, where she made a Dacron dress that, that she was looking at habits and how in our habits this dress sort of slowly fell apart whilst she performed a kind of a straightening of the dress. So, um, and we utilised this as well in a performance. So again, because she'd worked in a professional performance with her student project, she could put it in to the, um, as, a, as part of the professional aspect. And so in the end, this dress dissolves. And she made kind of multiple performances of it. And then for the architecture, um, the theatre architecture competition, um, one of our students um, uh, designed in the St Anna's Church, which was the site for the theatre architecture competition, designed this wonderful kind of atmospheric theatre for Raffaello di Sanzio, <coughs> where she looked at um, the construction people building a kind of construction as part of the performance that worked um, simultaneously with the performance itself. And out of 186 entries, she came first. Yes. And um, so, uh, again, you know, kind of looking at how she was a third year spatial design student, of looking at how you can kind of combine performance and architecture to make a performative architecture within this very, very ancient church. So this ancient church became the site for the next PQ, um, uh, PQ 11, where uh, I was invited to be the architecture commissioner for the Quadrennial. And, um, and so I called it Now Next, Performance Space at the Crossroads. And it was at the literal old crossroads of Prague. The church, St. Anna's Church, is now called the Crossroads, and it was set up by Václav Havel as a place for international encounter and sharing, cultural sharing. So it became an ideal space for looking at what performance space is now. So Now Next was really thinking about what is performance space now and what can it be next. And, uh, and, and through an ancient space that bears witness to the new. So uh, I made this installation of the downstairs and the upstairs, and they were linked by this tower, a media tower. So the goal, the goal was to challenge conventional notions of theater architecture and create a bridge between architectural and performance practitioners. So before that, 
there was the architecture section and all the architects went to see that and then there was the sonography section and, and the sonographers or the, the theatre people didn't really get all the drawings and models and, you know, and they were thinking of getting rid of the architecture section. So they said to me, please try and, and make it more part of the event and more of a dialogue between um, a sonography and architecture. So the goal was to create a space that explored the intersection between theatre as dramatic form and as built form, between sonography and architecture, between performance and space. So the exhibition was in three sections. One was the national exhibition downstairs, representing practices now. Each country was asked to say, what represents your country now? The open spatial laboratory upstairs, I don't know if Monica's here, but she was one of the... Uh, she was one of the, there she is, she was one of our, um, we had uh, about 21 young emerging designers and PhD students um, working together over the 10 days. So it was a living laboratory uh, within the space and within the city. And uh, as this open spatial laboratory, thinking what could it be next? And then the multimedia tower that kind of negotiated between the upstairs and the downstairs portraying projects that work between architecture and performance. So these were the images that we sent to the um, different countries, and we designed a table, a very simple table that could be this height, this height, or this height. It could be open at the top, it could have, be, uh, it could have drawers in it, it could have um, uh, monitors embedded in it. And we, that, that was a gift from PQ, the table, and it was up to each country to figure out what they wanted to do with the table. They could get rid of the table and have something that was the same footprint. Um, a table, in case you haven't noticed, is quite central in my work um, because I really think it's a wonderful place for gathering around. It's where we do a lot of our work and our thinking, sharing food as a community. And so we created this space uh, within this beautiful old church that had been decommissioned centuries ago. And um, here you can see the tower, and then another tower up above that was the projection tower for the laboratory. So what happened was uh, people came and they lingered because they lingered by the tables. They, sat, they could sit down at the tables. They could engage with the work in physical ways. Um, and then upstairs there was always work going on with the spatial laboratory, there were always symposiums going on and presentations going on upstairs. And I, I reconfigured the space to think about how a table becomes a way of presenting a performance space with these kind of landscapes of people either side. So again, this kind of transverse model, which again, I'm quite fond of. And, and, and more food, another landscape of food, opening the... Um, the, the, the event and also closing the event. So again, this kind of bringing together and sharing of food around the table. And then a book table where all uh, books uh, from different authors looking at architecture uh, could be scattered around the table and people could come and linger. And I also had a little espresso machine tucked under the stairs as well so that you could drink coffee or water. And so these are some of the images of the many things that were done with the tables, with people engaging. And this one uh, was particularly interesting because it was the first time that we had um, uh, somewhere from the Middle East exhibited and somewhere from Africa exhibited. So um, the uh, a Lebanese group of architects came up with the idea of Mosque del Mondo, where they took, which is on the cover of your book, the, the, the uh, Aldo Rossi's floating theatre, Teatro del Mondo, they looked at the, the uh, Swiss campaign to get rid of minarets, and they decided they would put the surviving four minarets that were allowed to stay in the mosques in, in, um, in Switzerland onto the famous Teatro del Mondo, and they called it Mosque del Mondo, and then they created this mat that they had woven in Turkey of, of a kind of abstract mat of the Mediterranean Sea. And the idea was that Mosque del Mondo would drift around the sea, becoming a site, a venue for discussion about kind of East, East and Western politics and, and performances. And it was, the only, uh, it was the only exhibit that wasn't orthogonal in the space. It faced Mecca.
So, moving exhibits, exhibits where you could take postcards, exhibits where you could listen to soundscapes, the book table, lighting within the table, and this is the French exhibit, Discovery, where a seemingly blank table could unfold different exhibits. So you had to engage with it to discover the exhibits. And then Mosca del Mondo, which I've... So, now we're getting up to next year's PQ. Uh, and again, the work that Carol and I have done has been selected by a, a national jury in New Zealand to be presented at PQ, work that we've done since Perth. And um, which is a continuation of Making Space Speak project. And again, we were thinking, how do we represent this project? This project was on the waterfront in Auckland Harbour, which is reclaimed land. And it's now become a public park, but it's full of toxic soil. It's toxic. It's layers. Of, it's ecologically problematic. And it's where um, the Māori used to fish for eel. So we called it A Thousand Lovers because Auckland um, is called uh, Tamaki Makaurau, which means the isthmus of a thousand lovers or the bride and her hundred lovers. And you could download the uh, soundscape online and come along and either be given headsets or have your own headsets and then you would all start at the same time and follow the performance across the site. And again, we were looking at mytho mythologies of that time and place and reworking what we had done in Perth specific to New Zealand and the site and the stories of New Zealand. And again, the red dress, this time she was Hine, who was a goddess, and the lover of Tuna, who was the eel, led you along. And you went, and, and more and more people gathered following the woman in the red dress until there was way too many people, went down to the waterside where Hine greeted her lover Tuna who swam to her in the sea and she threw out a rope to him and then pulled him out of the water and dressed him as a kind of a contemporary techno entrepreneur and he walked off into the city. We then did, we reworked this again as a kind of a dispersed performance in the same site as Tuna Mao, where we thought rather than follow the performance, what happens if we give people e headphones and they just discover the performance themselves in the landscape? So it was another experiment for a uh, oceanic performance biennale, where the work was who commissioned the work. So this time people could move around the landscape and discover the performers within the landscape rather than following. And then they ended up at the other end where there were steps. This, this time looking away from the city, where she shed her skirt and threw out a rope into the sea that bled into the sea. So again, we were talking about this kind of ecological uh, condition, uh, but also the kind of presence of women in Māori mythology and the relationship between blood and the sea and blood and the tide. Um, and now we're uh, taking this to Prague uh, and we'll, we've decided to call it Flood, Tongues of Stone Prague, uh, where we'll look at the notion of how do you work in a city that has all these floodings all the time. So we'll look at the mythologies of um, Prague and rework the work as it was reworked from Perth to Auckland and now to Prague. Now I'm going to finish off the final bits. You must be exhausted of um, the, uh, the theory talks. So this is the other hat that I'm wearing for PQ 2015, uh, which is part of this shared space curation. And I mentioned this uh, beautiful ballroom, um, how uh, the space that was convened for the shared space um, uh, symposium earlier this year in April was designed by Simon Bannum and Richard Downing, where they just scattered a hundred different chairs in the space. Um, and then the idea was that you could organise the space yourself. Also, on each corner of the room was a, a projection that could be linked to the, to the computer, but also linked to a live feed camera. 
So the idea was this multiple way of seeing now and being in space could be reflected in a performance rather than sitting in, in neat and tidy rows. Um, and it was fantastic. It, was, it, was, it really worked. Somehow you were awake in ways that one isn't always awake. So here you can see it's, it's, it's got the neat rows, it's in transverse, it can be in thrust, it can be in arena, but really it works beautifully with this kind of haphazardness because of the different projections that we have in our pockets, that we have all around us now on buildings. Uh, everywhere we go, we have these kind of glowing screens that are part of our daily lives, really an extension of our bodies in this kind of post-human condition that we live in. So it's not just about a kind of a screen sonography um, and this magical thing that's kind of taking over our lives, but it's much more about how we work with this global media and the screen. How do we work with political uh, conditions of our contemporary existence in a way that's meaningful and one of the works that I'm particularly fond of is Turnal Group Amsterdam's uh, Roman tragedies, where they took Coriolanus, uh, Julius Caesar, and Anthony and Cleopatra, and it was a six-hour performance in a large theatre where the audience could sit in the auditorium or could come up and sit on the stage, and the performance would happen around them, and they would watch on multiple television screens, the performance happening. So it was this really interesting experiment in the kind of role of media and the fact that these, these um, wonderful performances about war, ancient wars, meant so much today and made so much sense in talking about our contemporary war in the media. And as they've been performing it since 2007, they're always changing the images because war is continually happening. And so they're streaming what's happening in the world into the, into the auditorium. And people could, you were allowed to keep your phones on so long as you turned the ringers off, and you could text messages that would also stream. Or they would take things from Facebook or social media. So there was this wonderful sort of um, integration of uh, global networking and media and, uh, and the performance itself, showing how relevant it is today. And there's Julius Caesar laid out with Anthony giving his friends Roman's countryman speech. But earlier, Caesar had been chased out into the street, of, in this case of Brooklyn, while we were watching him in the auditorium on the screen. Um, and then he was dragged back into the theatre and killed. <laughs> and this here you can see people sitting and, and, and working on their phones while they're watching these multiple screens, while they're watching the performance. So this idea of these screens have become really interesting and in how they're used in different performances. Seven Sisters, for example, made a performance where you walked around a swimming pool and you could look uh, at a kind of uh, another story unfolding while you were in the space. And we know Blast Theory has done A Machine to See With, which was uh, commissioned by the uh, Sundance Festival and Rimini Protocol's wonderful situation rooms where they're looking at war and how you can bring people closer through the screen. So you end up engaging with the Senegalese people, Syrian people, people who are arms dealers, people who are child soldiers, people who are suffering from war in, in various ways through these installations but also through the screen. So I'm really interested in the way, for example, this was an installation I went to in New York, how everybody now double sees. They see through their camera and they see the, the, the performance. Another performance uh, here where the, um, there are little videos inside these installations. Uh, this was at World Stage Design last year and uh, people are busy photographing them. So they're again double seeing with these cameras. And I mentioned today, too, the, the, this wonderful project called um, Seen Fruits of Our Labour, which was done in Santiago by Omar and Osman Khan, where this black box appears in San Jose Square in Silicon Valley, and no one knows what it's about. It's just a glossy black box that's just landed in the plaza. And people are just kind of, it's just like an inscrutable object. But then people start to, lift up their cameras and take photos of it, because we like to take photos of everything, even black objects. And they find 
that there's this information streaming to them. And what they've done is, they're with the invisible workers of Silicon Valley, the, the people in call centres, the I illegal immigrants who are looking after people's houses and gardens, they ask them, what is the fruit of your labour? And they make these uh, answers, like to teach people the joy of using their voices. So you get these voices that are invisible, made visible to you through this object. But this object then becomes an object you share with people. So this very personal object then becomes a kind of a collective. So a collective is then formed around this inscrutable object with these people who are sharing it and seeing another, another thing through their cameras. So the camera is this kind of, I, I think of it as a, as a very complex thing. And, and in a way, you know, my reaction to setting up this room is it's very dominated by what we're doing now. So the live event is dominated by the recording of the event. Um, and, and the space is configured for this double seeing of the live and the represented. And in this case, this is Lucy Orta's wonderful piece that she did in Prague back in 2007, where the audience keeps its distance, but the photographers do not. They're almost like they're shooting. They're shooting cameras at them, but there's something very violent about this relationship that breaks the contract, the spatial contract between the viewer and the viewed, particularly in relation to this performance that she was doing around Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay and the kind of particular state of the world at that time. And this has been looked at by Barabeh Mrue, who is a uh, Lebanese theater artist and visual artist who has made this performance called The Pixelated Revolution, where he's looking at the role of the camera and shooting footage from the camera as a revolutionary tool in Syria, but also how people are taking uh, photos and, and recordings of their own death from snipers. So it's a very profound piece that he's made as a visual arts piece, but also as a performance lecture. So I'm going to finish now with the last thing I want to show you, which for me has been a very inspiring project in relation to this idea of the screen and the resistant screen, and how now projection is not just digital sonography anymore, but a real way of making connections, a real way of kind of having a, a human interaction and interface with people. And this is through a project which our Oren Sajiv was uh, involved in. He was the guy who did the intersection with Sodia. And it's called the Transparent Wall. And it was made in Abu Dis, which is a uh, Palestinian village that was cleaved in two by the wall, the security barrier. And um, the artists who were both Israeli artists and Arab artists, Palestinian artists, were so frustrated with this wall, they decided to make this piece called the Transparent Wall, which is so simple, but I think also incredibly radical. So what they did was they passed cameras through the holes in the wall that were used to lift the, the, the huge uh, concrete pieces in place. And through these little punctures in the wall, they passed cameras. And then they projected both sides of the wall, cameras from both sides of the wall, so that these trucks projected and they made a hole in the wall so that the people on both sides could then communicate with each other through these simultaneous projections. So it was a very beautiful moment where uh, a village that was cleaved in two was kind of making connections, talking on their cell phones to each other, dancing together all through this projection on either side of the wall that made a kind of a, a momentary window for communication. And so I want to finish by saying that performance design can provide a critical tool for negotiating and critiquing a proliferation of multiple historic, aesthetic, and quotidian performances played out in the new century and streamed 24-7 via the screens of smartphones, televisions, computer monitors, and architectural facades. The scenographic object bears witness through performative media, the body is witness, and a communal spatiality. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure 
there will be um, a lot of questions and that you are still yeah. ready to <laughs> answer the questions. So please, um, any questions? Yes. Um, um, uh, in the light of the few uh, last projects you've shown and the theme of the PQ 2015 shapes this, do you think that it makes sense to research a uh, virtual space, not just as a frame or a, uh, or a conduct for events in real space, but uh, as a space that has its own events, both everyday, historic and aesthetic events that originate from virtual space and affect real space? Yes, well, uh, in, in relation to the theory talks, uh, I can tell you who's coming because you're welcome to come, uh, is that we, we've got three talks, one after the other, um, in three different sessions. And the first one will be Micah Blaker, who's written a lot about visuality and theatre. And she'll probably cover uh, Rabeh Mrue's work. And then we'll have Gob Squad, who again looks a lot at projections and performance using projections and, and the kind of, uh, you know, that, that complicated relationship to, uh, uh, to projection and, and, and virtuality and uh, uh, different forms of timing. And then we'll have Rimini Protocol the last night, who do look at that idea of a sort of, I think more than any, really look at this idea of this kind of virtuality and how, um, you know, particularly the um, particularly the uh, the situation rooms that I talked about. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I think I th that's the thing that I'm particularly <coughs> interested in writing about next and thinking through next is that complex relationship of virtuality and uh, presence. So it's a good question, and I think it's definitely uh, and and it, you know there are lots of people obviously doing it intermediality has become a major uh, form of research at the moment in performance. So um, there's a lot of information about it. But how you do it through kind of embodied performance as a form of research, as you say, rather than an end game, um, would be very interesting. Questions? <laughs> Uh, yes, I do. I'm really interested in um, I'm interested in institutional theater, how it positions itself in a community as a locus. So it can be something that people come to see, but I think it also has a responsibility for an outreach, and a lot of theaters do. Uh, we were talking the other day about what's happening in Rijeka with the new National Theatre becoming the People's Theatre. It's a very interesting, uh, innovative way of looking at, at, at the National Theatre there. But I, I think that, you know, it's that kind of multiplicity, so it's not just about bricks and mortar, but I also think bricks and mortar are important because they place you, they locate you, but then dispersing that uh, is really important. And I think also working with communities is really important in a sort of participatory way. Um, so that theatre, you know, the, the problem is it's still a site for middle-aged, middle-class white people, generally. You know, it, it, it's, um, it doesn't have a, a kind of vast intergenerational, intercultural um, uh, viewers coming to enjoy it. So I, I, I think the institution, one of the problems that that I have with theatre architecture particularly is how institutionalised it is, particularly in relation to health and safety. But this is now on the streets too, so site-specific performance is becoming harder and harder to do in a risky way, or a way that really challenges because you have to make sure that you've done all these risk assessments and you've done all the health and safety checks and you know, you've got people with high-vis jackets stopping traffic and you know, it's not a kind of a negotiation because uh, uh, there's things to do with insurance compliance and, you know, um, uh, where often it's about money. Money is, is, is involved um, uh, and, and risks aren't taken. So I am really interested in, in how much an institution can become, uh, take risks today. 
Would you then say that site-specific theater is something that you would opt for uh, more than, than you know, choosing to work with any institution? Um, yes, yes. I, I, it's, it's funny because lately I think I'd quite like to go back and do a ballet or something, you know, and really kind of t test what a classical ballet is and what you can do in a theatre with classical ballet, how you can, so that it's, you know, it's, it's thinking about how you might leave the dead air of the theatre and then sort of maybe go back and open a door, you know, and, and see what happens. So, um, I think, you know, when I saw the, the Roman tragedies, I was so taken with how six hours could be so gripping and interesting. We I mean, have spent quite a bit of it in the bar <laughs> upstairs, uh, you know, watching, watching it on a screen and moving around and it was really fantastic in the way that it, it was looking at the theatre but in a way that made it much more flexible and um, not so regulated. Uh, still very regulated because we're all performing as good audience members. You know, that's, that's the thing that we do. We know how to perform as good audience members, but sometimes I think we've come to a time when we perform too well as well-behaved audience members and aren't, you know, so, uh, kind of, I don't know, speaking with our feet, leaving or, you know, standing up and, I don't know, somehow I, I think that uh, the audience has became, become a very tamed beast. Whereas I think it's a very dangerous and difficult beast, and I'm really interested in that tension. Well, that's why I think that the, the pictures you showed about um, Spatial Curation Symposium, you know, I had the same feeling because with, a, with a chairs uh, within a space mm. which you can move, you actually had a, a, an active audience, mm. and you can't just sit, you know, behind in the darkness and and listen you had to do something that's too far away but yeah yeah yeah, yeah absolutely it's great it's like um, you're there you're very there and um, you, you're also looking one direction and looking the other you know and we live in a we we also live in a time where we have a kind of a very multi perspectival view of the world as well very good at um, uh, multitasking being able to look at screens and watch things and you know, it, it's a different way of kind of being an, uh, have, having an embodied presence within a performance. So uh, I really love the scattered chairs. I think they work very well because I'm often jet lagged when I turn up to these things. So I kind of tend to. That's why I didn't want all the lights off because I fall asleep. So I knew that you know, if you're anything like me, you'd probably have a snooze too. So. Uh, there's something live about that scattering of chairs. Of course, health and safety issues. Maybe I shouldn't say, I'm so aware that this is going to go online, but you know, it's very interesting because as a theatre architect, you have to tie chairs down because if there's a panic, chairs fly everywhere and people hurt themselves. So I think they're taking a great risk in terms of what you're talking about. The institution of PQ is great for taking risks. That's what I really admire. And I think Sodia. Uh, has made has has really built it up uh, in a, in a wonderful way to to really kind of pushing the boundaries and the limits of design and space. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yesterday um, we were talking about uh, walking in someone else's shoes, and uh, I'm wondering uh, in your uh, design performance. Uh, are you ever uh, tempted to actually uh, uh, do it yourself physically, like uh, as, as, a, as a performer, as wearing the dress or, or going, uh, being part of that performance physically? Not at all. <laughs> it's so, it's so fun. I mean, I am because I think as an embodied, as a designer, I'm very embodied when I'm working in the city. You know, I'm working with the designers, I'm, I'm tying things on to them, I'm, you know, I'm working with them. It's a wonderful relationship, it's a kind of a dance. And in that way I'm very embodied, because I'm working in real space in real time, creating a performance. That's how I'm prepared to be embodied. I, I did, I was interested in the stage, you know, when I was at university or just before, and I, it was like drama school or uh, architecture school. 
And um, when I discovered designing and, and being able to kind of have an engagement with the stage without having to go on every night, <laughs> you know, I, I was very happy. But then when I discovered this kind of more embodied way of working with performers, that, that for me is really satisfying. It's not to say that I'm not trying things on and, you know, behind closed doors and, you know, exploring things. But, uh, but as a designer, I'm performing in the city, you know, really engaged. It's a kind of labour. It's, you're not conscious of being watched at all. You're just busy trying to, and watching, you know, and becoming really aware of the way the public move and perform. So that's why I say I sort of feel like I choreograph the public. I'm very aware of, you know, the relationship between the performers and the public. And, and in a way, uh, I enjoy being able to do that by, by stepping back from the live performance itself. But that's not to say when we're walking around, you're not kind of wrangling and, you know, you're just subtly, you know, making sure people are... But doing it in a way that, you know, that's not overt, so that they're aware of what's happening or where to look or not missing out on things. Sorry, I think it's in a hand over there. Yes, at the back, and you're the next one. Uh, uh, Anya, in relation to your question, uh, to the level of activity and involvement of the audience, I wanted to ask you, because the whole theatre history, the history of the buildings and your concepts, has obviously you know, challenged audiences uh, in different terms. And sometimes it, uh, the audience had to be involved more, the other times uh, in some other uh, forms of theatre was not involved at all, there was completely mm -hmm. passive. Mm -hmm. So do you think that this kind of democratization of the position of the spectator, and uh, particularly talking about that performance you showed us by the Netherlands art group, uh, that uh, classical Roman pieces, mm -hmm. where they chose actually the filter, through uh, which they want to see the play. So they actually chose the level of their involvement. For me, it was kind of a democratization of the position. Because uh, even if you uh, decide as a director uh, that you want to involve the audience, like you put them to sit on the stage, it's your decision and it's imposed on them. And this is a kind of a completely different position. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking, do you think that this use of personal digital devices uh, would lead uh, to more active involvement of the audience, or what do you think it will happen? It's a really good question, and um, I think you're absolutely right. That the choices that were made made it made it very interesting because there's nothing, you know, like audience participation where you feel like you're a performing monkey in the audience or whatever. Uh, so there were more choices given, like to be able to sit and have a drink in the bar way up away and still feel involved in the play and then try it in the auditorium. And on stage there was a bar you could buy drinks and food and move around. Um, but I think we also have to be very, you know, that we live in a time of the participatory performance, particularly in performance art as well. And I think, again, institutionally, it can be really co-opted co as a kind of a tool as well, where, um, you know, v Wagner, who was the, the person that, that made the argument for democracy in the theatre by sitting people in the dark, facing you know, facing the front. I think his idea of democracy was an idea of control. And I think we live in a time where democracy is contested. What is democracy? Wars are being waged in the name of freedom, democratic freedom, by taking away our democratic freedom. So we have to be very careful that these participatory, participatory performances are also not, in a way, playing with that as well, where you're all participating and performing again as good citizens in a participatory way. So in some ways, you know, and, and that sort of sense of participatory art has been questioned, is currently being questioned as well. So the, the idea of democracy and performance, I think, is a very, very interesting one. Um, yeah, I'm particularly interested in it in relation to the public theatre in New York which claims to be democratic space set up by Joe Papp, who was an amazing visionary. But I, they've just had a $40 million um, renovation of the foyer. And the idea is anyone can come into the public. 
but there's such a strong overview. It's so intimidating. They have the best chef in New York providing the food. You know, it's not, they have, the, he's got the restaurant upstairs. It's not really accessible, as, as I think Joe Papp would have liked it to have been. But I think the public is in a position where the only way they can raise money is by performing to the cognoscenti who will become sponsors. So now, for example, Joe Papp set up uh, the whole idea of free Shakespeare in the park. But now, if you're a number one sponsor, you can get a seat. You know, it's kind of done in such a way that because the sponsors are so important and that's the only way that you can fund your theatre, that in actual fact it's become hierarchical in a way that I don't think Pap would necessarily have agreed to. Who knows, I can't speak on his behalf, but I just think that uh, for me, the idea of American democracy is very strange right now. Very strange. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, it's a curious thing. So I think democracy is, you know, is something that can be manipulated to argue for things. So you know, that the idea of the Wagnerian stage is a democratic stage. Not necessarily. So it's a good question, but we have to keep understanding that I think that participation within these big communal events sometimes is also problematic as well. You know, it's not necessarily a kind of a, uh, a critical involvement as a community. Do you have a question? Um, yeah, I was interested in, in bias in the sense of, um, like, um, you mentioned bias as witness, right? And then um, I was trying to figure that part out in terms of your whole concept of uh, design. Can, Can you speak a little bit louder, please? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I was wondering about the bias, is the bias a witness? What do you really mean by that in terms of like architecturality, so to say, within the, the scene? The... I think it, it works in multiple ways. I, I, the examples that I showed were, uh, there's, a, there's a range of different ways you could see it, but for example, in the in the exhibition, the exhibits tend to be a kind of a passive relationship between the viewer and the objects that are on view. So I'm really interested in how bodies can become part of an engagement, which is why I like the table, because I think you can sit around the table and start to engage with other bodies uh, across the table in a kind of in an informal way. Um, and for example, in, in PQ, uh, the last PQ with the with the spatial the open spatial laboratory. The idea was that there were always bodies who were kind of researching and working, and other bodies could come into it. So I was really interested in how at the centre of a live event is the event. So how do you make an exhibition where where it's an event, an ongoing event, where people are thinking and working, and and you can just kind of uh, drop in and become part of that. Um, it's complicated. I think it's complicated. It's a big question you're asking, actually. It's a really good question uh, because, you know, in the city, having these women's bodies uh, dancing in the city is kind of a little problematic in relation to how vulnerable they are, but how much they protect each other by being in the moment. Because you have, the again, the well-behaved audience with the, with the headphones, but the, but the accidental audience can be quite threatening. Um, so it's a very complicated thing, but again, uh, what I like about working with dancers <laughs> is that they are very in the moment, they're very willing bodies, but they're also very willing to protect each other and, and in the case of the work that we do, improvise. Um, but it's a good question. <laughs> Do you have any, are you thinking about it specifically in relation to anything? Uh, well, yeah, I have many thoughts, but in terms of art, because um, we talked about architecture and then the, the, the scene, scene code, and then so the scene landscape, sorry, and then the mm -hmm. And then I was thinking in terms of bodies and, and how we talk about that. And in, in certain parts, I felt like they were kind of lost, but then they were brought in back again, mm -hmm. and then it made me kind of question um, how can that understanding of performative design or design performance be attached to the actual human body, 
but that's very sensitive, as you said. Mm. And, and uh, over the uh, course of my education, we talked about it a lot. Mm. So the body politics and mm -mm. yeah, what they really mean when you have certain body <coughs> stage and things you can do with them in terms of design that that kind of thing on the actual body. And <coughs> So then you think in terms of architecture and the, the, the actual seamless of it, like how the connection in relation to where, where it's present, where it's not, and, and then where, where it's really witnessed or where it went to the audience and how do we really know. Mm. And then you think of the cameras and the, mm. the new media and what's going on there, especially with the Oliver King's camera and all that. No, it is very huge. Come along to the theory talks and, you know, I think there will Prague, be, in Prague, Prague next year, I think there will be, uh, I'm hoping there will be lively discussion about this at, at the theory talks. Okay, I think we can have one question more, Ramana. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about education in this hybrid field, performance design, from your perspective and from your experience, what is the most common or maybe the most interesting or maybe the most inspiring place to teach research this complex discipline? Is that art, um, art school or schools of architecture or fine art school, drama um, school or what? Um, That's such a, such, a, such a good question and a very <laughs> challenging because uh, I first set up the performance design degree between a design school and a, a, which is the in the academy, the university, and in the drama school, which is the conservatory. Very different ways of practicing, very very challenging for the students. But I think in the end, you know that it, it didn't last because my university, you, for reasons I will not go into. Um, uh, so we integrated it into spatial design, but we lost the connection with the drama school, which I think is very sad. In a way, they are two different cultures, but I really thought it could work. But again, the institutional politics, I think, got in the way. Um, I'm very lucky to be involved with the University of Tasmania that are setting up this Creative Exchange Institute who are really keen to have a kind of interdisciplinary performance laboratory type situation. In which case one thinks also in Alto they're very committed to that long term, building that kind of embodied exchange and artistic research and interdisciplinarity. Which makes you think in relation to Novi Sad as well, it's on the peripheries, the so-called peripheries. We're not we're a centre. Right now we're absolutely a centre. But within the perception of a kind of Western globalised world where we think of America and Europe and, you know, those kind of centres. It's a sort of peripheral condition. Tasmania is very peripheral. Helsinki is very peripheral. In a way, Novi Sad is peripheral. And I think that is really exciting. You know, I think that it, it's kind of trying to disturb the periphery. And in many ways, it's exci I lived in New York for about eight years. I love New York. But in many ways, it's a great place to consume, but not an easy place to produce. And in many ways, it's very, very conservative. It just happens to get the best coming from around the world. But really, it's quite conservative. So uh, it, in a way, that these kind of peripheral conditions that we're in allow for a kind of radicality of thought and practice. So that, that would be my answer, yeah. Exploring the limits at the limits. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay, before Thank we you. close, I have two information, actually one reminder and one information. The reminder is that an open call for the PQ Students National Exhibition of Serbia is closing on the 20th of November, so the, the, its time is, you know, coming to the end soon. And the information is that those who uh, are here for students of doctoral studies from the faculty needs to sign uh, on a list because you know that's how you you um, have to actually uh, achieve your, achieve your yeah, credits. So uh, please do that at the end and thank you uh, very much for this wonderful uh, talk tonight. Thank you.